welcome to Betariel Congregation. I want to ask you a question. Who believes in miracles here? Yay, amen. By the way, we have one here today, and uh, that's Danielle. Where are you, Danielle? Danielle, uh, there she is. You know, um, I, I, I want to tell you, we're, we're so glad to have you with us because I remember... Uh, you know, even the night before your operation, I know that the, 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 the doctors were not positive at all, and we had a prayer meeting here, and here you are today. This is great. And I think you wanted to say something, right? Come on. Come on. Yes. No, no, you have to put it on. Yes. 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 Mais en tout cas, je suis bien contente d'être à la maison Bétariel, la maison du lion. Euh, comme vous le savez, j'ai une, une embolie aortique bilatérale. Uh -huh. Et puis les médecins et les chirurgiens m'ont dit, c'est vous qui allez choisir. Vous acceptez la chirurgie, il y a des risques. Vous refusez la chirurgie, la chirurgie il y a des risques. Ça fait que pendant deux jours, ça a trotté dans ma tête. Puis moi, je, il faut que je vous dise que j'étais vraiment, j'ai vécu quelque chose de spécial avec mon Dieu. J'étais environnée de sa présence, de mes prières et tout ça, puis j'étais prête à m'en aller. Je ne pensais pas ce que je laissais en arrière, mais j'étais prête à m'en aller. Alors donc, j'ai décidé que oui, j'acceptais la chirurgie, mais Daniel n'était pas au courant. Donc, mes enfants étaient au courant, mais pas Daniel. Puis, il se promenait avec les enfants pendant que j'étais dans la chambre, bien sûr. Puis, il dit, moi, je suis inquiète pour votre mère. J'aimerais qu'elle accepte la chirurgie. Ça fait que après 58 ans de mariage, nos enfants nous ont fait signer un contrat que lui prenne ses trois repas par jour et que moi j'accepte <laughs> la chirurgie. That's right. Et puis en tout cas, c'est des que j'ai vécu avec Dieu. Très bien. Good. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, we've seen, you probably uh, felt how strong her voice is. And I'm telling you, to me, that's a great miracle and praise God for this. Now, soon we'll have the uh, feasts. The Jewish feast, of course, you start with uh, Rosh Hashanah, and we have a pamphlets, English and Yiddish, right? A lot of people in Montreal, a lot of Jews in Montreal still speak Yiddish. That was translated by Sharon and by Connie as well. Uh, you can take a few of them. They're going to be in the, uh, right on the piano. And, and also, uh, when it comes to Sukkot, Sukkot, we're going to have a baptism, a mikveh. That's great. And if you've never been baptized, um, you know, if I was a Baptist, I would tell you that you're living in sin, but I'm not a Baptist. But in any case, if you've never been baptized, come forward and see me. Uh, that is after the, uh, the, the worship itself. And one more thing I want to share with you. Uh, you know, we had the youth, the youth, the Shiloh youth in my house on uh, last Saturday. Great. We had music. We had the word. And what else? Food, right? We ate and ate. It was great. To me, that's great. You know, this is the next generation, and I want to put as much time as I can to encourage them, you know, to stay in the scriptures, especially today, you know. Many, many young people are moving away from the faith, and I praise God for this is another miracle that we have. The youth together, we have the youth, and we have the young adults, and we have Timothy here who's taking care of our youth, and Jessica, of course. God bless you all. So let, let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. This book is very much one of extremes, where, where drama and important biblical concepts are mixed together, where, where human frailty and God's counsel clash. But nevertheless, opening up this chapter is like getting out of a long tunnel into a new bright era of the history of Israel, where feuds and families' quarrels are put on the side for a while, for it is a crucial mom moment in the history of Israel. Here David is finally anointed king of Israel, of all Israel. This is the, his third anointing. First with Samuel, then by the people of Judah, now at last by all the 12 tribes of Israel. It took 20 chapters from 1 Samuel 17 when God first chose him to get where we are today. It is also in this chapter where David conquers Jerusalem. Jerusalem. For the first time, this city is associated with Israel and the Jewish people, and Jerusalem will become the capital of Israel 3,000 years ago. This city is called the, the city, 
God's city. It is the place he chose to build his temple and to dwell and to eventually establish his eternal kingdom because Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel now during the messianic times and forever. Because this is where God's going to bring the new Jerusalem, which is heaven, down on the new earth. And so since this moment in 2 Samuel 5, Jerusalem has been through so many wars and conflicts. It's been built and destroyed over 17 times, besieged over 45 times. And today, after 3,000 years, it has become one or most probably the most disputed piece of real estate in the world. And I believe will become even more so as we're getting closer to the second coming of Yeshua, to the rapture itself. Because this is the place where Jesus says, I'm going to build my kingdom. And amidst this history of opposition, it is in this section where we read of one of the surest and strongest promise of God about this city and about David. The Davidic promise. This Davidic covenant says that there will always be a descendant of David. And there is a powerful connection for us. A powerful connection between this promise in 2 Samuel and the New Testament. For the New Testament opens up with this covenant. The first words of the New Testament are the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Here is the beginning of a fulfillment of this covenant we find in our text today. And this promise is eternal. That, it, 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 would, that is, it, it will continue even today and later on. And by the way, this covenant tells us that there's always going to be a Jewish family from the tribe of Judah, right? Always, even into the messianic time. And it seems that forces of evil understood the great importance, the great turning point in 2 Samuel 5. In our chapter, just after David conquers Jerusalem, the Philistines assemble together in great number, but this time they come so close to Jerusalem, at the door of Jerusalem, to stop David. Their presence interrupts the flow of the history, but they're always part of it. Always. This is when David inquired of the Lord. And the Philistines lost. But they came back. Even more numerous. Very determined. Sure to win. But they lost again. And they soon will come back again and again and again. Their decision, I want to tell you, their decision to fight David at the moment he occupied Jerusalem. And their de determination and persistence here and later set precedence in the history of Israel even today. This is where we understand that the battle has great spiritual dimension to it. This is when we better understand this incomprehensible hatred that we find in the Middle East today. However, in the midst of all this great history which is going on, there are so many practical applications for the believer today. For instance, when David decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he failed. At first, he failed. Why? God was so much with him because he didn't do it according to the way God asked him to do it. That's why. Because he relied on others. Because he did not check the information. But what is the way of God? What was the way of God for them? And what is his way for us today? Where do we find his will? David is going to teach us. After this first failed attempt, David seemed to have learned so much. And what follows is, a, is such a successful life with God, at least for a good while. And this is this key of success I want to have and I want to share with you. Let us now see how the Ruach HaKodesh inspired every single word of this wonderful part of the scriptures. In the opening verses of 2 Samuel 5, we see a representative of the 12 tribes of Israel coming to Hebron to anoint David. There they finally recognize that he is God's anointed after so long. And we read in verse 3, verse 3. It says, Therefore all the elders, elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron because before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. 
Israel is now the name adopted for both the south and the north of the country as they are uni united, as it is today. The city of Hebron, where is it? Not far from Jerusalem at all. It is well chosen for the first gathering of all Israel, for this is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived. This is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were buried. The, the rabbis in the Zohar thought that this was a necessary move for David and the nation needed to reconnect with their history as all the tribes of Israel now gathered after 500 years. Hebron was also known as Kiryat Arba, right? means the city of four. And so to make it four, the Jewish legend said that along with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Adam was also buried there. I want to tell you, these legends are always very colorful. So like Jerusalem, today Hebron still stands and is very much a contested land. It is now divided between Israel and the Palestinian, right? And there's no harmony. There's no harmony. And this past week, you know, I want to tell you, I experienced something great that I want to share with you. You know, as I was reading this story in 2 Samuel, at this very moment, as I took a break and checked the news, the news spoke about Hebron, right? It, it someone hit me like a brick. Here I was reading a 3,000-year-old text, and the very same city pops up in the news. Right? It, you know, it was this past Wednesday, Wednesday, when they reported that Netanyahu, Israel, the prime minister, made a visit to Hebron marking the 90th anniversary of a 1929 massacre of 69 Jews who were actually planning to take control of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem but were prevented and they were killed. So during his visit, Nathaniel stressed the Jewishness of this city and says that the Jews will remain in this divided city forever. See what he says. You know, after seeing this connection, this is when I stopped and I thought, isn't it wonderful to, to read such an, of, of, about an ancient city that you find also in, an, in the scriptures itself, right? This was a gift. Somehow at this moment, I was in awe. You know, sometimes, you know, when you feel the presence of God, when you see the presence of God, you just stop, stop. And just meditate. This is when I remember, and this I want to share with you, that the word of God, the Bible is what? True. It is true, through and through. As David said himself, he saw it, he had only the Torah. He says, the sum of your word is truth in Psalm 119, the chapter, the long chapter of the scriptures. And Jesus confirmed this, as he said, if you abide in my word, in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the word of God is fully inspired. All of it, right? Remember 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures is inspired by God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All of it, from the first word in Genesis to the last in Revelation. And I believe this is a prerequisite to fully allow the Spirit to reveal things to you when you open up the scriptures. While many times our emotions, our feelings will lead us into defeat, like we see in the scriptures, the word of God is an instrument that gives solid guidance and direction we can count on all the time. And David knew this so well, and we see it in the many Psalms that he wrote. And the scriptures produces faith. Right? We read in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more you read, the more you will see God. This is what this verse says. The more you read, the more you're going to feel his presence next to you and in you. And along this, one last verse. The word of God judges our thoughts. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to join do judge, that is the thoughts and intention of the hearts, right? It is living, that is, it has life in it. Okay? Through its power, men are born again. Through its power, men are changed every day. It is living and powerful because it is from God himself. And it is sharp because it goes to the division of soul and spirit. That's one thing I never understood, right? The, the, the difference between soul and spirit. I don't need to. Just have to read the word and it goes right there, right? And all of this about Hebron, and we have not come yet to Jerusalem yet. But see where the text 
The next verses in 2 Samuel brings us. They are like a beautiful prophecy. Verses 5 and 6. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Many numbers are given to us, and numbers speak in the scriptures. David was 30 years old when he began. Why 30 years old? What do we know? What do we need to know about this? This is the age of beginnings, right? Numerically, it is seen as three times ten, where three stands for what is solid, real, complete, like God's three attributes, omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence, right? Or, or the divine completeness and perfection that we see in the triunity of God. And number ten is the perfection of divine order, like the Ten Commandments. So 30 is the higher degree of perfection of divine order as marking the right moment. And so this is the age when the priests began their duties. Like John the Baptist, who was a Levite, he was 30 years old when he began his ministry. Joseph also was 30 years old when he stood in front of Pharaoh and became second in command to, in Egypt. But above David and the rest, Jesus, Yeshua, was 30 years old when he began his ministry. This is where I believe the text wants to bring us. While David tried to unite and save Israel, only the Messiah will succeed at the end. And there is another number which reminds us of Yeshua. Notice how long David reigned in Jerusalem. 33 years, which amounts to the love of the Messiah on earth who gave it all for us, all these 33 years, to fulfill David's role and to bring Israel and ourselves into salvation. And here we meet the number 40 again. David reigned for 40 years, seven and a half in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. 40 is the number of trial, of probation, like 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus had his trial already, remember, 40 days in the wilderness. But the 40 years of David's reign and the 40 years of Solomon's reign as well did not produce redemption and salvation for Israel. The reader then will seek the Messiah through the failure of this man. This is why they're there, I believe. And seven and a half years in Hebron, David goes to, after that, he goes where? Jerusalem, also called Zion, the city of David. The two last names, Zion and the city of David, are new. Okay? This is their first mention in the scriptures. But let us begin with this familiar city, Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel, Jerusalem becomes the capital of the Jewish state. It is the capital, the navel of the promises given to David, as it is today, by the way. But who was there before the Israelites? Who occupied Jerusalem, the Jebusites, the Jebusites, the Jebusites are a Canaanite nation. They're, they're presented as so confident of themselves, so proud of themselves. They thought that no one could beat them for Jerusalem was high on a mountain. And see what it says. Look at verse 6 and 7. And the king, David, and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusite, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. You know, it is true that this city was so hard to conquer, right? It was on a hill, surrounded, as you see in the map, by valleys. So the Jebusite thought that if they put the blind and the lame, it would be enough to defend Jerusalem. And ironically, from this moment on, David used the title, the lame and the blind, as a nickname for the Jebusites, because he conquered it. Who were the Jebusites? Important to know. Our index, our table of nation found in Genesis 10, tells us that they were sons of Ham. Like all the Canaanites who lived there, they were not Semites or from Shem, like the Israelites, like the Jews. And since the time of Joshua, they occupied Jerusalem, and no one could beat them. Now, listen to this. This is important. No one could beat them. Not the people of Judah, right? Not the people of Benjamin, who could not either beat them, which makes this city the ideal place for David. 
It is only when he was anointed king of Israel that he was giving the eternal promise that it was conquered. Jerusalem then is an ideal place because no tribe can claim it. It is there like a floating city gathering all, if you want, of Israel. Gathering all to the, of the, that is, of the believer. So it is a very special place. It is as if it rises out of the land. This is why the city is called God's city, the holy city, the city of justice, the faithful city, the city of peace, the beautiful city. And these names are, are prophetic. For today, it seems that it is none of these things, but the best of Jerusalem is yet to come. And while the Jebusites occupied the city, they were not the first owner. Do you remember who was the first king of Jerusalem? I'll put it on the screen for you. Melchizedek. Melchizedek at the time of Abraham. You see how it links? Melchizedek, this is the first time, with him, it's the first time we read of this city, which is called Salem, peace. Psalm 76, David himself tells us that Salem is Zion and Jerusalem. Melchizedek, Abraham, and David, all these names bring us yet to another dimension of the importance of this city of Jerusalem, right? And this is not the whole connection between Abraham and Jerusalem. There is something which brings Jerusalem to, a, to, to, to the dying and resurrected Messiah. It appears under another name. Eight chapters later, how was Jerusalem called? Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, this is when Abraham was asked to go and sacrifice his son. A sacrifice which never took place for it was the pro prophecy of the sacrifice of the Son of God. Just like we read in Proverbs. The death of the Messiah. There Abraham gave yet another name to Jerusalem. Jehovah Jireh. God will see to it. God will provide. And he did indeed. He did. 4,000 years later, Yeshua was crucified on the same mountain, Mount Moriah. God provided salvation. You know, this is how far Jerusalem brings us. From Melchizedek, who is a type of the Messiah resurrected as king and priest, and Abraham, to David, to Yeshua, and to a wonderful future for anyone who sees this great plan of redemption that the Lord has, has laid down for us. But what does Jerusalem mean? You know, you, you would think that we would know by now, for it is mentioned at least seven 700 times, over 700 times in the Bible, 643 times in the Old Testament, 62 times in the New Testament. The usual definition is the city of peace, but it's hard to figure this one out from the Hebrew. The word Salem is there. It means peace, but what about the rest? Some read Yerush Shalom, that is possession of peace, or Yeru Shalom, as the foundation of peace, or Uru Salim, that is the city of peace. I want to tell you, some ancient rabbis in the Midrash Rabbah, a commentary on the Torah, may have picked up a true and very appropriate definition of Jerusalem. They pulled the a definition from both story of Melchizedek and from Abraham and Isaac, and they gave it in the form of a beautiful story. This is how the story goes. And Abraham called the name of that place Adonai Jireh. And Melchizedek called it Salem. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, if I call it Yere, as did Abraham, then Melchizedek, a righteous man, will resent it. And if I call it Salem, as did Melchizedek, Abraham, the righteous man, will resent it. So I will call it Yerushalayim, including both them, Yere and Salem. And so the name of Yerushalayim will be God will provide Peace. This is what it says. God will see to it. God will provide it at the proper time. So Jerusalem stands as a prophecy of the coming of Christ. And this definition, I want to tell you, is right on and it suits us very well. Jerusalem containing both words to provide and peace. Speaks of the work of the Messiah, whom God provided as the Lamb of God in this very place. And who is now our peace? The only and everlasting peace, right? Is of course Yeshua. You know who said that? Isaiah. 
Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisements of what? For our peace, our shalom, our salam was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. This is who the Messiah is. The lamb, okay, that Abraham saw, right? And knew God will provide. And he came and he died so that the chastisements of our peace was upon him. And the Bible says that he himself now is our peace. Ephesians 2. Now let's stop for a moment with the promise of peace, with Yerushalayim. Question is, do you have this peace that the Bible promises now? Now. Are we experiencing this peace today? You know, the scriptures pictures, pictures the, the, the believer in Jesus so differently from how we would naturally perceive ourselves. Without the Bible, none of us would dare to believe that all these things could be true. What does the scripture say about the believer? That we are children of God. That we have been spiritually adopted into his family according to his plan which existed before the creation of this world. That Yeshua has redeemed us, forgiven us, enlightened us, and is making us whole on both a spiritual and physical level in heaven. He has become our peace. And we have been sealed, do you know that, by the Holy Spirit? And he made us secure by his very presence. To this, many of us might respond, I want to believe all this, but I'm having trouble. I don't feel like I have infinite worth. How could I have inherent worth? Look at these things I've done. Many people say that. Look what I've done in my life. How can God love me with all my faults and with all my deficiencies? Well, I'm glad you asked. God can love us the way we are right now. Okay? Just like when somebody discovers a gold mine. What happens? The gold asks, however, how can you love me? I'm all dirty. I'm all mixed up with that worthless iron ore, and I have that sticky clay all over me. I'm contam contaminated. But that God responds. He says, oh, no, I know how much you are worth. I'm going down there and pick you up. Because he did that. He suffered like we did. So in many ways, we are like Jerusalem today. While called peace, and while the provision of redemption is there, it just doesn't look like it today. But it will at some point. So rejoice in the blessing that Yeshua has given us. Every time you hear of Yerushalayim, think of the peace, the peace that Yeshua has given us. Now there's another, there's something else we should notice. The city of Jerusalem was known even before Melchizedek and Abraham, as far back as 4,500 years, in what is called the Elba Tablets in Syria. But you know what? <laughs> it was spelled differently. The first letter, the Yud, wasn't there. So it would read... Rushalayim, right? But the Bible, they added the Yud. What is the Yud? This is the first letter of the name Jehovah. Yud Hevav He. As if God stamped this city and he says, now it's mine. He sanctified it and he said, it is mine. It's not surprising that God calls, calls it the center of the earth. The center of the earth. And it's not interesting to see that then David made it the capital of Israel. I want to bring that again. And 3,000 years later, after it was occupied and destroyed so many times, today it is again the capital of Israel. Amen. And it will stay the capital of Israel forever. Despite the coming wars that are coming, right? Jesus is coming back right there and will rule the world from there, as the prophecies tell us. You know, I want to tell you, we're living in exciting times. Exciting times that, there. And it's no wonder that so many battles were fought in history and the final one will be fought right there, right there. And you know that today the three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, claim it and want it for them, right? But it belongs to God, okay? Who will give it to the remnant of Israel during the Messianic times. But the name of Jerusalem today evokes so many emotions, anger, jealousy, even fury, not only today, by the way, throughout the whole of history. H have you heard of the, the origin of the expression hip hip hooray? Yeah. Well, many say it is difficult to figure out the true origins. Others insist that it comes from the Latin acronyms Hiero Solima est Perdita. Jerusalem is lost. This is what people believe.
It is a term that gained notoriety, especially in Germany, as the title Hep Hep Riots, which makes reference to the pogroms against the Jews, which lasted from August to October 1819. It started then. Some people ran and said, hip, hip, and they were killing Jews. Jerusalem is directly connected with the Jewish people and with Jesus himself and with us who are believers in the scriptures. Now back to our text in 2 Samuel 5, it is in verse 7, where we find two new names for the first, for the first time in the scriptures. The city of David, I think you have it. Let me, that's it, the city of David, right? It says, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, right? Zion means stronghold. It's a tower because of the difficulty of taking this city. And so the name Zion came to designate the Temple Mount and also became synonym to Jerusalem and also refers to all the people of Israel, Zion, the daughters of Zion. Today we call the Zionist one who believe the account of the promises of God in the scriptures and affirms that the land belongs to the Jewish people. This is what it means. The other name, the city of David, affirms the promises of God. The Davidic covenant itself. It does not belong to him, but it recalls the prophecy and the promises of God, we'll see in chapter 7. And the account of the conquest of Jerusalem ends with the words in verse 10. So David went on and became great, and the Lord of God of hosts was with him. Notice the name of God here. The Lord Jehovah, God of hosts. If you want, uh, by the way, you, you want to make sure that you don't meet, okay, uh, God with this name. That you have had the name of Yeshua already on you, right? Because this means that he is with the armies, all the angelic armies. This is how he stands for the protection of Jerusalem and by extension for the protection of all believers. Let me bring you right down to verse 17 where we're going to see him in action. You know, as soon as David took Jerusalem, we see all the armies of the Philistines coming where? Right at the door of Jerusalem, just like you have it in the map. They came from the coastland right there. We're told that they came as close as the Valley of Rephaim. That is when David felt this great danger. He had only an army of 30,000 people, and we know that the Philistines way outnumbered the Jews. Does that sound familiar already? Right? When the Jews came back in 1948, 1956, and so on, all these armies came against them. And so we read in 1 Samuel 13, 5, that he had something like, they, they had something like 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. They still had the same amount or so of soldiers. So in the face of su such great perils, what did David do? The right thing. He asked God. He asked God. He prayed. Verse 19. Look what it says. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? He knew he could beat them, so he, he asked for God's help. And God says, go, and I will deliver them unto you. So he goes and wins the war, and the Philistines fled. But you know how they fled? Look at verse 21. I'll put it in the screen for you. They left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away to burn them, as we know in First Chronicle. They left their idols behind. They left their religion behind. Behind. They left their gods. And this is the second time they realized that their own religion, their own gods, could do nothing for them. The first time was when they captured the Ark of the Covenant, if you remember, and brought, brought it inside their temple. And what happened to Dagon? He fell right face down as it prostrated to the Ark of the Covenant. They lifted him up again, and he fell again. Right? They don't learn. Now, they just abandoned him right here. They abandoned everything. But you would think they, le they learned something. Their hatred, I want to tell, was powerful than their faith. Their hatred was more powerful than their religion. They come back, and in great number, and they come back in the same place. Again, David does what he's supposed to do. Again, he inquired of God, and he wins again. And here in 2 Samuel, every time we read that David spoke to God or inquire of the world, the God. Okay? The Targum translates the verse as the way 
actually as if he read the scriptures, as if he went to seek the word of God. You know, the Targums are, are those Bibles translated into Aramaic, which are believed to date before the first century, and also believed to have been the, the, the scriptures used at the time of Jesus. But I want, I want to show you how they translated 2 Samuel 5.19. And David asked the memory of the Lord, saying, shall I go up against the Philistine? The memory is the word in Aramaic. David asked the word of the Lord, knowing to know that is the will of the Lord. You know that the Urim of Tumim perhaps were not available even at that time, soon after David. So he went to the Word. This is why John began his book by saying, we can translate it this way. In the beginning was the Memra, and the Memra of the Lord was with God, and the Memra of the Lord was God. This they would have understood because they, first, they were the first audience. And in 2 Samuel 5.19, is only one among other strong passages about the Memra. In verse 23, it says, And David asked the Memra of the Lord, and it said, and so on and so forth. What is the Memra of the Lord for us today? It's actually the Scriptures. The Scriptures. This is where you find the will of God. right? Pray about it. Pray to God, and He will show you some passages that will speak directly to you. It doesn't matter how many times you read these passages. Open it up with faith, and you will see. And so the second time the Philistine came, the Lord, the Memra, acted on behalf of Israel. This time the Lord tells him not to face the enemy, but go around it. Look what he says in verse 23 and 24. He says, you shall not go up face to face, that is, circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the, on the, in the top of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. This is where we see or hear, if you want, the sound of the mulberry trees. The mulberry trees are majestic. They, they can grow up to 10, 10 to 15 meters or 30 to 50 feet and are covered with, with a rich cap of leaves, and with the right wind, they can make some loud noise. And here the Philistines heard them. They heard the sound of marching troops, the sound of fear. But when the Israelites heard the sound, they heard the sound of victory, the call of God. We're going to go back to this, because there's no two ways to see God, right? Either as a judge or as a savior. And it's after this victory that David unites the 12 tribes, something not seen since the time of Moses. And this is when he decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. This is when we enter chapter 6, a very practical and yet a solemn chapter. We just have the time to have a brief bird eye view of this chapter. You know, David is so excited about it, he, he thoroughly prepares himself before he brings the Ark. This account is parallel to the one in 1 Chronicles 13. So we learn in 1 Chronicles that David gathered and inquired all the Levites for the proper way to bring the ark into Jerusalem. It was so important that he also called all the Jews all over the world to come in as if it was the beginning of the Messianic times. We read in 1 Chronicles 13 that he brought them from Egypt. He brought them from Syria. It was a new era opening up. And once he did it, we read in the first verse of chapter 6, and again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000 of them. 30,000 choice men just to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. These were, these were not for war, actually. It was for rejoicing. He wanted to make sure to, to, to have such a great feast at this time. He didn't want to miss anything. Notice the word again in verse 1. The first time was for war. This time was for rejoicing. And we learned that he made sure that there was a lot of music. By the way, that was David's forte. Look at verse 5. It says, Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord, and all kinds of instruments, of fir woods, of, uh, on, on harps, on strings instruments, on tambourine, on sistrums, and on cymbals. It must have been loud and beautiful, but... But it did not work. It didn't work. 
something happened, something was forgotten, someone, some people did not do their job properly of telling David how to do it. The procession was interrupted because one man, Uzzah, touched the ark, and it says that God struck him for his error. Even the word error is so rare. It's hard to figure out what actually went on. But what we learn is that the Levites did not do their job, did not do it according to what God prescribed in the Torah. David understood, by the way. The ark was not supposed to be carried in a, in a cart or pulled by animals. It was to be carried by men, choiced Levites. For this is what he did the next time, and it worked. How could they miss out on such information, right? On such important information uh, and, uh, on something as holy as the Ark of the Covenant? What happened? How come none of them gave him the right information? We see that David got angry. Is this the beginning of a separation between the king and the priests? Between the teachers of Israel and the people? Between the teachers of Israel and God? Is this a prophecy leading us to the first century when these same leaders did not recognize the Messiah and misled the people? And why in the second attempt, David wore the linen ephod? You know, which according to the Mosaic law, no one can wear it except if he's from the tribe of Levi or except if he's the high priest. David was none of these things. And God was not angry. Is this related to Melchizedek? The priest according to the eternal order. Did David understand something? We'll find out the next time when we see these things. We'll cover this great chapter 6 of 2 Samuel. I would like to conclude with the title of this study. The Sound of the Mulberry Trees. This title actually... Uh, First, I want to tell you, these mulberry trees may, may remind us of all believers today. All believers. It's a beautiful tree. We are beautiful in the eyes of God. But it only uh, gives fruits, by the way, after 10 years after its birth, which is true for some believers as well. Right? But it is a tree with a great ability to, to, to be reborn all the time. They say that even after the mulberry trees have been blown down from a strong wind uh, with their roots exposed, can continue to grow and set fruit for many years. Just like the believer. The righteous man falls seven times and he rises again. Okay? We never fall forever. And this tree is known to withstand impure atmospheric condition. But this is when a believer in Yeshua okay, is in Yeshua. Okay? And these trees grow better in areas full of sun, full of sun, as when the believer, when you are under Yeshua, under God. Right? And furthermore, in Israel, the leaves of the mulberry is used to produce what? Silk. Silk. With which they use to make costly fabric. You know, through Ezekiel, God said that he covers the believers with silk, of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. This is how he does it. This is how he sees us. It was these leaves which gave, gave silk, which made the sound, actually, or noise. And so is the believer today, covered with the silk of salvation, also proclaiming the word of God. To some it is foolishness, but to others it is salvation, right? And especially for those who grab it. And to all we ask, have you heard the sound of the mulberry trees? Especially today, as we're coming so close to the end. Again, to some, it is victory, it is freedom, salvation. To others, it is fear and destruction. It was the sound of mulberry trees which gave the signal for David to go ahead. How then can we hear the right sound of the mulberry tree? Today, I will conclude with a prayer of salvation. This may be the most important prayer and decision one can make in his lifetime. It has to do with our eternal future. The prayer itself does not save. It won't save you. But it will confirm that you want to hear the sound of God and to be on his side. It confirms that you know by, that by yourself you cannot go to heaven. The prayer is like a covenant, a covenant you make with God. If you feel God, 
if you feel that he's calling you, if you feel him in your heart, if you feel the love of his spirit in you, and if you have not yet accepted Yeshua as your personal savior, you can repeat this prayer with me. In this prayer, I will say that today I recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, as my Savior. I will ask that everyone close their eyes. And you can pray, you can lift your hand with me if you pray this prayer. Jesus, Yeshua, today I recognize that I'm a sinner. Today I recognize that you came to die for my sins. And today, I open the doors of my heart to receive you as my Savior. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. In Yeshua's name, amen, amen. If you made this prayer, come and see me afterwards. I want to pray for you. And those also on the radio, YouTube, or Facebook, if you have prayed this prayer, write me. And now to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen. May the Lord bless you all.